Ah, okay. Yeah, they can yeah. Oh, wait, that's just... Or we can just uh, move this here. Yeah. Right? It's a bit better. For the live stream. So, stage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no. And do you see? I think it's good, no? Okay. So, uh, welcome to fourth meetup of our ladies. Uh, yes, I think now we're kind of starting to be very comfortable presenting and uh, uh, organizing this. Um, so there is a Wi-Fi. I don't know. Do you actually connect? Manage to connect to it? Uh, so you just yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll need it for later. Yes, for later uh, because of the hands-on data. I think it's going to be very important. Um, so, for the first time, we are also um, streaming uh, these presentations. And uh, for those who are following us on the Twitter and from the stream, you can leave the comments on the Twitter and ask any questions, please, or comments or feedback, or what would you like to uh, see next time. And yeah, we are very open to the new suggestions and uh, uh, comments. Okay, so. Um, for the new faces, which are today, um, so welcome to the Our Ladies, uh, I would say like a global project, because the Our Ladies is just a, a part of this global initiative, worldwide organization that uh, tries to promote the gender diversity uh, in our community. Um, just uh, recently, this big initiative started to be um, uh, part of the Our Consortium, one of the primary projects of the R Consortia, so it's uh, very much supported. Um, it's very spread out, so it's in the 110 cities, so every city has its own chapter, and there is a big community on Slack, there is uh, uh, lots of going on on Twitter, so I also um, encourage you to join a Twitter and follow different chapters as well, they have really interesting uh, things uh, coming up. Um, so for today, uh, we plan to do a kind of a lightning talks, which we uh, imagine like a thunder talks because they, it has a kind of R in the end. So, um, and Lisa will present and uh, on the circle spots, uh, Susan with a text analysis, and uh, Sinaya and I will introduce a bit of about the tidy Tuesday, and uh, this all. Um, kind of place. It's hosted by the Impact Hub, so we are really grateful that they um, allow us to be here, and the Apollo is supported by the R Consortium. So uh, we thank all of the speakers already for uh, giving a talks, for Impact Hub for hosting us, and for the R Consortium website. So you can follow us uh, with the news there as well. Uh, we also have uh, interviews with the speakers, which are really nice speakers, but also nice uh, interviews with them. Uh, also, you can uh, get involved if you go to the uh, community tab. Or uh, send us some, some code for the blog if you would like to participate. Everything is uh, everything is welcome. Just uh, just, just uh, contact us. Yes, just uh, contact us. And if you would like to also participate in the on the bigger scale, there is uh, uh, the, there are projects that are part of the Our Ladies Global that you can also contribute. So for example, you can uh, list the algorithms and the data structures and uh, try to wrangle the data there, or you can participate in the development of the Shiny app um, and so on. So um, I think they would really like uh, you to see the, the activity of of the Our Ladies. Uh, participants. So the next 
meetup. We will have a break, summer break, and the next meetup will be uh, in September. Uh, we didn't still plan what exactly, but uh, there will be a questionnaire that we would like you to fill because we would like to know uh, the feedback. What would you like still to uh, to see? And we will uh, gladly take these comments into account and try to do something about it. So this is very important uh, for us to know, uh, so we can uh, continue um, organizing the meet meetups. And thank you already for coming. Uh, if you have any questions and comments, just and if you would like to give a talks, um, please uh, just contact us. Why I'm stressing so much about the talks, I think the, for the women it's very important just to practice, practice, practice. And uh, I think it's, it's going to go much better and flow and more self-confident. And it's a friendly environment as well. So, Okay, so uh, I think, uh, Sina, you can introduce Lisa. Lisa, hello. I will just change the presentation. Okay, oops. Anyways. Just it's really hot. <laughs> Thank you. And it's actually quite flexible. It can handle different data types. It's just generally labeled as a genomic data tool because the creator himself is in the genomic field, but he's expanded it to include all different types of data. Where can we find Circles? You can actually get the software itself from the website. It's an application and uh, it's easy to use. There are online tool versions as well. Um, some are specific to biological data like Circles VCF, which handles uh, whole genome uh, sequence variants that are found in variant calling files, for example. And our main interest for today is the R package, R Circles. Um, I'd just like to bring to the attention, the fact that there are some data that is not necessarily genomic. An example of this is a Nobel Prize laureates, where you have the um, countries uh, where, where Nobel Prizes are awarded and in what field they're awarded. So the data generally for this one would look like a table of uh, countries and fields, and you could represent it in a bar plot, but then you'd have a, a heavy amount of data, whereas here, True, there's much, but it's easy to follow. The curves are gentle on the eyes. You can easily tell in the same region. So there's a lot of self-links. And what's really cool here that usually would have been maybe not so clear is that a lot of the movements happen within the same region. So there's a lot of self-links. America people from South Asia to West Asia. So very interesting patterns that are easy to grasp straight away. This is how it will be plotted. So you have the rows and the columns that represent the parameters of your circles plot. And uh, the, the columns that represent the parameters of your circles plot. And uh, the, the, the columns and the rows are each colored differently in terms of their segments. And usually the ribbons represent the, the data that's associated with, for example, row C and uh, column 1, or row C and column 2. So you have ribbon 50 and 25. Now, the size of the segments also corresponds to the sum of the values that you have. So it's just everything is there and everything is nicely seen. The ribbons usually come out of the row segment with the same color and uh, don't exactly touch the column segment, just normal uh, circles um, guidelines. And this is how it would look like if we plot the entire thing. Quite easy to go from this to that, actually. And this was done on the circles online tool. So you just fill in this data, upload it, and you get it, this plot. Um, in another example, where we're trying to do a link data visualization in terms of genomics. So this is an example of that. <coughs> where you're trying to study associations between SNPs found in the same chromosome. Now, usually, if, and of course, the different colors we have represent the different types of associations. Normally, you could do that either by using a heat map for every chromosome and seeing the different colors that you have and if they're enriched in a certain area, or you can just put it in this one plot. And, uh, well, we start off, since it's genomic data, our parameter here instead is an ideogram of chromosomes. That is basically all the chromosomes we have concatenated into a circle. 
And what we're looking at is the links. We can easily grasp that, for example, chromosome 15 is highly enriched in the blue association type, uh, 14 not so much. And uh, another thing that's really interesting is that chromosome 15 has associations in only one part of it, so one arm of the chromosome. They're very concentrated over there. And the data behind it would look something like this, where you have, uh, well, it's not, there's a chromosome segment here, <laughs> the chromosome where the link starts out from, the base pair position, and the chromosome where it ends at, base pair position as well, and the plot color. It's quite simple. When you look at this data, it might be overwhelming, but it's just, uh, it's really easy to use. So having said that, having seen a few examples of the plot types you can do, I'm happy to say that actually r -Circle supports more types of plots. Now we just saw the paired location, you can add scatter, line, histogram plots, heat maps, all of them are easily combined and you can add them in a single figure, provided that you put them in different tracks, for example. That way you'll have a lot of information nicely organized in one place instead of several places. And of course, you can edit the colors in order to better understand the data and what you're trying to present. Um, it's a piece of cake, honestly. So let's have a look. After you load the data, you can check the heads of them. So this is the ideogramic uh, point of view. And uh, after we had the data and we know what we want to plot, it's important to set the core components. The core components basically um, are made out of the ideogram that you want to use. So you load it and you specify it here in your core components, which chromosomes you'd like to exclude if you don't want to include all of them. And when you know how many data types you want to put, you can decide the tracks. Now here there's inside and outside because our ideogram, in fact, is the core track and you can add your uh, tracks with respect to it, either inside or out, to represent the data. These are quite empty now, but we'll see how we can fill them on in just a second. So you're ready, you have your data, you have your ideogram. Let's set up the plot area. The first thing you're gonna do, <coughs> you're actually gonna plot the ideogram, and uh, here we decided not to exclude any of our chromosomes. And uh, next, we're gonna add, um, the gene name. So just very simple commands, very generic. Your gene data is the gene name. Let's have a look exactly where that is. So you'd be looking at the fourth column. That is the gene name that you want to add here. And it already knows where it starts in the ideogram. And you're adding in the command above it, just connect your lines to make it easier to see. Um, now comes the interesting part where you actually start adding data. So this is the heat map. Similarly, you're using uh, ready-made data. Of course, you can add your own. You're specifying which column you want to use, similar to the gene data and which track. So we moved in a couple of tracks to number five, just to give a space to have it visually appealing. We can add some scatter plots, even line plots, histograms, tile plots, it supports a lot of things. And the most interesting in my case is uh, link and ribbon plots where this is, you have your associations that you are interested in and they're nicely represented here. And uh, well, they're differently colored than the actual ideogram because we chose like by chromosome false just to have a nice random rainbow color. And uh, there's, it's a lot flexible. You can edit it once you have your information in the right spot. For example, if you want to add some label data, you will increase the spacing between the beginning and the end of your ideogram just to explain what plots you're having. And it can be, there's a steep learning curve for this, but once you know it, it's quite easy, which is why I really think these are the Bible of using our circles in general. There's the Circle software tutorial for the actual uh, main tool that can handle any type of uh, data that you've got. And there's the R Circles GitHub demo that has demos. And the one we just did was the human demo right here to, to see how the plots can look like. This is more genomic oriented. So those are the difference between the two, but they're, they're both relatively easy. So as some uh, take home messages for R Circles, once you have your data set, it's really easy to plot, to format, to layer, to 
adds a lot of information and it's visually pleasing. It looks pretty. You can get your plot on the cover of a nice journal. Um, there's a strong online community. Um, lots of tutorials available. The community likes to help. It's very challenging. Uh, just one downside, in my opinion, or maybe a plus side, depending on how you look at it. When I learned our circles, I automatically learned Illustrator just to edit. So like the legends we saw, you have to add the labels yourself, you know, but it's, uh, it's worthwhile. I think it's really cool. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions. <laughs> okay, so questions? Just to the last point, uh, maybe when you said we have to learn how to use Adobe Illustrator, yeah. you know, just to adjust yeah, the just or but it, because you already produced them in R, right? Uh, no, so, so this one, as you can see, these labels were manually added. You can mess with the spacing, but uh, the R package isn't as updated as the actual software is, perhaps, yeah. Okay, thank you. So of course. does that mean that the styling of, uh, you know the very first chart that you showed at the beginning of the presentation? The... That were not related to genomic data? Yes, yeah, let me uh, go back to that. Have they been like styled in Illustrator after, or can you actually uh, reach no. that, that level of... Here. You can actually, these were done using the R Circles uh, software itself. And uh, it's quite easy. They probably set the colors for uh, each of the countries, for example, and that's how you can set them up. It's really widespread, uh, it has use in multiple fields, so yeah. I also have a question. Go for it. Um, if you have genome wide data, or mm -hmm. maybe like a million uh, rows, yeah. how, how is it performing? Um, well, it depends on the the laptop that you're well using it from, and plus some limitations for R, but it, it can handle it quite well. Just the graphic device will. Is this what you're asking? Yeah, like because sometimes when you, for example, if you if you make a scatter plot, yeah, with uh, uh, set with with hundreds of thousands of lines, mm -hmm. it will take a long time to plot. Right. That is true. So here you would just uh, generate it into a PDF, I guess. Yeah, or and even the PDF would take, it would plot exactly. dot so by dot, yeah, yeah. Uh, into image. Yes, plus also R provides you with the ability to set the, um, how do we say this, the, the quality of a PDF. Yeah, the, the PPI. If you call it, yeah. uh, if you call a PDF outside before <coughs> plotting, yeah. then yeah, you can set the quality that you want and have it a bit lower. Okay. Yeah. Is it more flexible in R to um, I find it flexible in R just for genomic data, so it's limited for that because it's it was built in, in that domain. But in fact, it's really quite easy to use if you have the data in the correct format. That's just the the tricky part to have. Um, for example, it took me a while. I know it's silly to realize that um, in my link data here. Uh, so usually, a snip has one position, but I had to edit this out so to add another position. A base pair a difference of one to actually produce a line plot, you know, just these small things that I didn't think of before. But it's, it's okay. And in the software, does that automatically? Uh, no, so, so when, you, when, I'm, when I dealt with the SNP originally, my data was just a location. Mm -hmm. So I had to create a second column and add How one to all of it. Um, I think it would handle it in the software quite easy. Yeah, and it's more non-genomic oriented, but yeah. And how did you find the the genomic data for the No, it was literally as easy as just like clicking the buttons. You just you write the command, and it's uh, it's all kind of the same. It was cool. Do, do you experience a problem with factors or? Uh, I mean, definitely, these have to be numeric. All numeric. Yeah. Continuously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, this is okay to be character, especially like uh, the gene labels and just a normal data frame setup. I would say. I didn't uh, really get the end. Um, you said we have to add one. So what happens if we add two? Oh, nothing. It's just um, so well. For, for link data, the difference has to be one, but if the difference is greater, then it would become a ribbon mm -hmm. instead of a, a line or a link. 
which is what we saw, I think, uh, at the very end. Like this one compasses uh, a, a larger range. Yes. Yeah. Because it's like corresponds to the the kind of the stripes that are like the numbers that you take. Mm -hmm. How much space you want? To exactly. Take. Yeah. If you're dealing with regions instead of a snip, for example. Okay, All right. no questions? Then thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot. So yeah. we know how to talk. To <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so the next speaker is Susan. She just passed her PhD yesterday. So oh, we are ready. Time. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Andrea, can you help me changing the slides? Um, I can't use my lesson. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, do we have a Wi-Fi connection? Yes, your yeah, Wi-Fi connection is here. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Susan, and I'm happy to present to you today. Um, uh, information about um, the Quantita R package. This is an R package used for computational text analysis and um, I used it during my PhD so I will tell you a bit more about how I used it and uh, how perhaps you could use it uh, yourselves as well. Uh, so uh, I started using R about three years ago as well. Um, I uh, um, I have a background in pharmacy and public health, so for me the learning curve was quite tough. <laughs> but uh, and I'm still learning, of course. But uh, I found uh, this package to be particularly uh, useful, and I will tell you uh, more about it. Um, yeah. So the um, uh, paper, uh, the analysis that I uh, used the R package in is. Uh, just got published also a few days ago, and this is the name of the um, of the publication. In case you want to know more details about what we did, you need a picture. No, 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 no. <laughs> Susan, could you just um, move it? I know it's hard with the. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Yes, you're fine there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I will tell you first about the data. So I work with patient data from the Shuv Hospital here in Lausanne. So basically there is um, an intervention so that the patients can take their medicine better. It's like a, a motivational interviewing with, uh, with the patient. And then this text from the motivation interviews are transcribed in, in the report that you see on the left side. So I had, I had a lot of those reports. So I had about 8,000 uh, reports uh, using uh, patient and pharmacist uh, texts. Uh, uh, no, it is typed in, luckily. <laughs> and um, yeah, I could basically, it, it was possible to get, uh, to get it in a text format in Excel. And then uh, this could be imported into R, and this is how I started uh, the analysis. Um, so um, there are several packages in R that do the computational text analysis. I only used Quantida, but there are more packages with different features. Uh, but I guess they all work in the same mechanisms. So you can import your data uh, from even web pages, from uh, text files, from Excel, any different format. Um, this generates like an R text uh, corpus um, and the R corpus is where basically you do your pre-processing and cleaning. So in my case, I was interested in um, single word and double word and three syllable uh, words. So for example, uh, I am for me, so was one token or one word. I was also one word and I am happy was also one word. You can predefine and preset this as, as you wish. Um, then you generate your tokens, which are the bigrams or the single grams or the triple grams. Um, you, 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 you create your um, data text uh, uh, matrix, 
or a, a list of those tokens that you identified and uh, then you start your analysis. So I was particularly interested in getting an association of those words used during the motivational interviews with having a, a good clinical outcome or a bad clinical outcome. And I also had this data. So you can link your frequency of words with an interesting outcome as well, which is a pretty neat feature. Um, so this is an example of using Quantida in political science. So this is an analysis of the presidential debate of 2016. So here you see some frequent words used by Hillary Clinton, such as planned uh, parenthood, social security, women's rights. And here you see the words used by, by Trump, like make America great again, and strong borders, open borders, some contradictions. So it's, it's pretty neat in analyzing uh, frequency of certain uh, words. Uh, this is also another application of the same package. So basically, uh, this is data from um, uh, the UK. So they were monitoring um, Twitter feed uh, when people tweeted about certain flu symptoms. Uh, this is the list um, of the words according to their strength of association with a flu event, let's say. So here you can see lung uh, symptoms, sore, high work, etc. And here they mapped out the frequency of uh, the Twitter flu score in a certain region in the UK together with the Health Protection Agency flu rate. So this is the, let's say, the epidemiology sur surveying service in the UK. And they had a pretty high correlation uh, as well in their analysis. And this is the reference in case you want to look up this paper. It's, it's really good. It explains the methodology quite well. Um, so uh, this is like a code snippet of, uh, of how you can use this code. So you start with uh, the, your, your library. You, you, you import your data as well. And then um, here you can uh, define if you want to have only single words or double words or triple words or even more than that. Um, you can use different models. So here I used a logit model. So it was a logit model for the association with high or low clinical outcomes. But you can also use a Gaussian model. You have other possibilities that you can adapt. Um, you can also then um, define your, your, the weights of the different words. So here I'm, I'm, I'm telling it, okay, I, the word weight is, is positive uh, outcome in my analysis and I'm, I'm setting if it's more than zero or less than zero, then it will be negative. And this creates sort of a, uh, we will see like a word, uh, a word cloud with the different uh, outcomes. Uh, what is also pretty neat is that you can um, use a list of stop words. So, for example, the words that are frequently used in the language, such as uh, uh, and, a, an, and you don't really want to run a frequency analysis of the text using common words such as that. So, there is a predefined list of words, stop words, it is called, that you can uh, import as well. And uh, you can also add your own words to this list of stop words. Um, so if there are certain words that you don't want to be included in your analysis, you add them to your list of stop words. Uh, what's pretty cool as well is that you can then search uh, within the um, whole corpus. So let's say you found out that uh, this, this particular word had um, an interesting outcome and you want to look up, okay, what, how, when, what were they talking about? Because you only get the word, you don't get the, con the whole content or the context. So this is a keyword, a keyword in interface approach. You basically have to write, um, uh, okay, I want to look up this, this word uh, in, 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 the, in the corpus. 
and then it's going to show you all the instances where this particular word was used then you can read through it and you can understand more about the contest uh, content uh, and I think it's pretty neat as well um, you can uh, draw a word cloud uh, with the most frequently occurred words for example um, and uh, you can uh, specify the, the features of how you want it to look like. Uh, for example, you can say that the, uh, the size of the word is associated with um, how frequent the word was used, for example. Um, so here, this is a list. So my text was in French, so if you don't speak French, it doesn't really matter, but these are like examples that I added to the list of um, stop words uh, that I found like really useless and I didn't want to to, to in my analysis. Um, yes, so in, in essence, this is the main uh, uh, cool things that you can do with this package in your, in your text analysis. So, um, this is just some of, of the results the, from the words that I got. So I could get like, uh, were, uh, patients were talking about not having any more side effects. Um, uh, the, this is the list of words that are associated with a positive health outcome. No more side effects, getting support uh, from a partner or a husband, uh, being in a good mood, etc. Uh, and the words that were associated with a low or a bad health outcome, it was um, crying, worrying, uh, hiding the medicine somewhere because they didn't want to share their uh, status, being homeless, things like this. So it, it's pretty neat to, 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 to tell you which words and with the keyword in contest uh, uh, interface, you can read more about what they were talking about uh, exactly. Uh, so this is the word cloud. So these are all the, let's say, the words or bigrams as well that were associated with a positive health outcome. And here you see the words that were associated with uh, negative uh, health outcomes. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, this is all for, for now. Uh, thank you for your attention. and. Uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Questions? Yes. I was wondering now, is there something like a clustering method behind it? And can you also change some methods? Uh, um, you know, just that, for example, I don't know, we say method equals <coughs> A, and then you get certain words that are associated with uh, your outcome. Yes. Like when you choose method B, for example, you get different words that are associated with um, outcome, whatever. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, this, the, the, the approach that I used is called the dictionary approach. Mm -hmm. And in this approach, it's already one approach to do things, and this is how it is done. Uh, so basically, there are different approaches. So there is also unsupervised learning approach and supervised learning approach. So in those methods, you don't have this preset things, but in the dictionary approach that I used, it is already predefined how the clustering is done. But I think if you can, if you want not to use this preset uh, clustering, uh, you can use another uh, approach, which is unsupervised machine learning or supervised. But I've not used this, so I cannot really uh, say more <laughs> about how it's done. But that's a, that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. The method allows you to tell if there is a significant difference between because I don't see in this plot uh, uh, the difference on the frequency on the words. Maybe a, a few yeah, numbers yes. matter, but yeah. if you get so you, numbers. Yes, of course. So you get like um, a list of. Uh, positive and negative coefficients mm -hmm. that are ordered from very high to very low. So zero is like your neutral point. And then you get um, a list of coefficients that are, that are ordered. Then you can look at the strengths of association. And uh, it uses the lasso regression point. Uh, but yes, you do get a list of the strengths of associations. So what I did is that I, I basically, I had 7,000 
terms to look at and I took the first 100 positive terms and the first 100 negative terms and I read the context of those words so this is also one approach that you can use because you get depending on the size of your text you get a lot of things so you can choose a cutoff based on the strengths uh, of association mm -hmm. yeah yeah yes um how accurate is separation if you didn't use the context because sometimes if you add the word never or like it negates it yeah you have to change a lot i i have to say it, it's a bit tricky. It's, it's not a clear cut, let's say. Um, but uh, you can get away without too much reading uh, of the content. But you definitely have to do some content reading. It's, it's not really like, uh, I mean, it depends on the text as well. I mean, uh, it depends on how your text looks like. Uh, I had to put a lot of stop words. Uh, because I, I got those by uh, associations with positive and negative and then I was like okay I don't want to get those words anymore because they keep happening in both outcomes of interest so I added them to my list of stop words so this is like kind of one way to, to get over it but uh, yeah the downside I mean it's not really a downside it's just it's normal because you're working with text data so it's never really gonna come as a, as a clear cut uh, yeah yeah so the way you iterate your stop words search, yes. do you also iterate your token search? Uh, like the way you define the tokens, like premier jour uh, and so on, because you have to define them first or not? You don't have to define your tokens. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to define, define your tokens. It, it, it okay. takes care of it. Yes, yes, yeah, it's the dictionary method that takes care of okay. this, but, yes. Yes, if yes. You wouldn't use a dictionary, but did you try to? I mean, use, if you would use yeah. another, how it would affect the result? Then, uh, I um I didn't really try. <laughs> um, so there another approach is it's called a topic model, which is mm -hmm. also different. In You associate a, le a list of words to this topic, uh, and then it does the separation using this preset topic. It's another approach as well that you could use. Um, in in my case, I only used this, and I didn't really, let's say, have time to try anything else. Uh, but maybe maybe you should look into it. I think yeah. it could be useful. Yes. Yeah. question. Yes. Like how was the documentation? Like, was it easy to find like information about this and the question related to that? Yes. It's like, did you find any thing about like what's like uh, the main like when should you use which kind of? Um, yeah, method. Yes, so there is a very good informative paper used by the creators of the of the package. So it's called uh, the first author is Casper Welbers. Um, and the last author is Ken Benoit, and it's called uh, quantitative, Computational Text Analysis Using the Quantita Package. If you just type in in PubMed, you will get the paper. And uh, the paper was really very detailed, and it's really explaining the difference between each of, of the approaches. And the pros and cons, it depends on like what you really want to do in the end. So in my case, this approach was useful because I already had a predefined criteria. I already knew that I wanted to link specific words with this clinical outcome of it is high or low, positive, or I already had this. So the dictionary method was appropriate. Other methods can be useful. We don't have this preset when you just want to tell you, let the data tell you which outcome is good when it's associated with a specific words, for example. So yeah, the paper was really excellently written, and um, I think it's it's really straightforward and it's very detailed. Uh, I should have probably written the reference on the slides, but never uh, yeah, it's never too late. Um, but I, I I can send you the the, yeah, the reference. Before, before I leave, yes, I will look look the paper up and we can put it up. Uh, I have to say I was particularly lucky as well because I did a, a, a course with uh, one of the people that uh, wrote the package as well and this was really, really helpful. So um, I don't know if the course is still there, but it's at the London School of Economics Summer School and um, it's a two-week uh, course. Uh, in general, it's about... Uh, data analytics, so I, I find the course really, really useful. 
so if you get the chance uh, to, to, to look it up, I think it might be still running. I only did it like three years ago, so it's probably still uh, running. So London School of Economics Summer School. And uh, yeah, you will see something about data analytics and uh, this would be this course. Yes. How long does it take to process? Yes, it doesn't take very long. It doesn't take hours and hours. Like um, it, it's not, it's, it depends again on your corpus and whatever, but it, it, you will be done in less than an hour. It's, it's not very long. Yeah, yeah. yes. Same more general question, but uh, did you recruit males and females? Yes. So can you then look into gender differences? Yes, you can. Yeah, I, I, I looked at gender differences uh, only with my outcome. So I kind of mapped out the difference in the positive outcome between may, men and women and the difference in, and also by age. Uh, so you can sort it out also by age, by gender, if you have other specific uh, criteria. Um, I, in the end, I mean, I, I just listed enough material with, with this uh, as is. But uh, yes, if, if you want to look more in depth by groups, by age, by gender, uh, as is. But uh, yes, if, if you want to look more in depth by groups, by age, by gender, uh, it's possible. So then, would uh, depend on your question, but could you actually, in the beginning, I guess, to uh, correct the data for gender if you want to see just the general effect independent of gender itself? Yes. So you first correct it and then apply it. And then apply and this. Then yeah, something, something like this. Or if you only want to use the part of your data that is male, this is just our yeah editing stuff that you can do, and and, and it works as well. So it's great. Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you. By ourselves. So if you don't. Uh, so if you would like to hear less from us, you just need to contribute more. <laughs> so this is the way it works. Um, but yeah, we were very happy to have this uh, online. If you want to have hard cover, you need to buy it. But it's, uh, uh, so it's this address here. And so um, Jessie Megan, she was, I think, reading it, but it's, uh, uh, so it's this address here. And so um, Jessie Megan, she was, I think, reading the book and she in it created this, uh, initiative, uh, website, the blog, they are very active on Twitter and, and they have a Slack to kind of learn all together. So like all over the world, right? So it's not like uh, you learn something in a class anymore. It's like you all learn together all over the world. And so type um, then you also can transform into data, which is usually a deeper. Um, so data wrangling mostly. Uh, then you can visualize it, as you know, with the ggplot, the models, and you can also program with the per. So all this together is a part of the tidyverse. And um, there's a special piping. So, um, yeah, you just, because this gives kind of a better visibility of the code. Uh, tidy Tuesday, right? Yes. And, oh, sorry. So, yeah, yeah, so tidyverse, it takes a bit of time to learn. Um, uh, or A read underscore CSV, and then you have a bit different arguments and so on. And so all basically all the base functions they have some analogous function in the tidyverse, or even better. But there, uh, yeah, there's a big discussion like is it better to start with tidyverse directly or not? And I, I uh, maybe a small comment: it's not only Hedley Wickham who, who okay. yeah, it's like yeah. many other people oh, contribute now. But he's like yeah, he started it. He kicked off uh, everything. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, so now what is Tidy Tuesday? So it's a weekly data wrangling and visualization project. And so I put here the GitHub. Okay, so now what is Tidy Tuesday? So it's a weekly data wrangling and visualization project. And so I put here the GitHub wrapper and the details. So uh, the, uh, all the presentations are Tidy Tuesday. So it's a weekly data wrangling and visualization project. And so I put here the GitHub wrapper and the details. So uh, the, uh, all the presentations are on our GitHub wrapper. Uh, so if you want to, it started only a few months ago. 
so we're uh, we're still in the game and it, it kind of it addresses this need of learning the tidyverse ecosystem by separating kind of the technical aspect uh, we're still in the game and it, it kind of it addresses this need of learning the tidyverse ecosystem by separating kind of the technical aspect and interpretation technical aspect and interpretation so by looking at uh, because if you if you use your own data sets so let's say we all work and uh, or, or we are students and we have our own data sets we always have this need of like we want to transform it to something that we can inter interpret like we run models uh, to, to inference and this should separate this so we're not we're just purely doing the technical aspect and um, so the data sets that they so the data sets that they uh, already quite tidy but they're not like super tidy so it still gives you they have a lot of missingness and like there are a lot of, a lot of things there's a huge potential for each data set to to work on already quite tidy but they're not like super tidy so it still gives you they have a lot of missingness and like there are a lot of, a lot of things there's a huge potential for each data set to to work on um okay so the way it works it's that uh, on monday uh, so it all works over twitter it, uh, the date is released, that's why we all should have a Twitter account. Uh, the date is released on Monday and you wrangle and visualize it on Tuesday. Twitter. So that's basically what they say as well. Uh, and the data set, uh, so I, I call it the gold mine because <laughs> it's, uh, it's not often that you have like a curated list of cool data sets, a uh, list of cool data sets. Um, and it's like, uh, yeah, it's a huge variety of, of different kinds of data. You have like 